everybody, and welcome to a special holiday edition of Boobies and Newbies, the podcast that asks novice romance readers to think outside the dick in a box and brave the unbridled world of erotica. I'm your host, Kelly Reynolds, and today's romance review marks the second episode in Boobies and Newbies annual special, The 12 Days of Boobsmas. We are just getting started, my friends. Join us all December long for 12 holiday-themed books, 12 mini-pods, and 12 giveaways. Be sure to keep up with all of the giveaway opportunities via our social media channels at Boobies Podcast across them all, although by the time this episode airs, Twitter may very well be dead. Nonetheless, enter to win one of 12 holiday romance reads graciously donated to Boobies and Newbies by the authors and or publishers. If you feel like spreading a little extra dose of boobs, Miss Merriment, you might consider leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or supporting the podcast on Patreon, both of which would certainly make this Christmas elf a little extra jollier. In addition to this year's Boobs Miss Reads, I'd also like to take a moment to shamelessly plug my own holiday novella, Meet Me in Los Feliz, which is available now. Grab your ebook or paperback copy and maybe an extra one or two for the romance readers in your life. And last but not least, if for some reason you've missed any of our previous podcast episodes or you feel like you need something to tide you over until the next episode of Boobs Miss Drops, You can find all of our previous episodes along with so much more on our one-stop shop of a website, boobiesandnewbies.com. And now, please join me in welcoming my second day of Boobs Miss guest, fellow podcaster and the host of the All Good Dogs podcast, Kate Barkley. Hi, how you doing? How you doing, Kate? Welcome to the show. Thank you. I feel like there's like a lot of pressure on me the second one. I'm glad I'm not first, at least. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Yeah, they're going to keep you listeners, listeners interested. Like <laughs> You are plenty interesting. I only wish I had somehow found a rom- a Christmas romance or a holiday romance with, uh, with dogs involved. I feel like I found the least dog-ish one out there. So shame on me for not thinking about that. <laughs> Well, I mean, you found the thing that I like, and that's a gay romance because, and and again, I feel pressure. I'm not like a newbie romance reader, Kelly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm excited to have you. I feel like this has been a long time coming because I know it's been a a minute and a half since I guested on an episode of All Good Dogs. So we we had to get you over here, and I know that you love romance, and I know that you love a queer romance like I do. So it seemed only appropriate, but maybe next time a queer romance with a dog. Well, you know, funnily enough, I just, um, I've covered a few of them on my show, but um, nothing, nothing Christmassy that I have found either. So, you know, maybe I can find something and we can reconvene next year and be like, (laughs) here, this is a queer romance with a dog. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I feel like with all of these recordings, what I will start to think about is, oh, it was so exciting reading like this kind of Christmas romance or this particular setting in a holiday romance. And then I start, my brain starts playing like, oh, but you know what would be great if we had this, this, and this in one book. So I'm just like putting it out there for all the people who write holiday romance. Like, okay, um, make it gay, but also a dog, please. Like, let's do it. Exactly. And there's so many like writers out there that are creating, there's always like great gay Christmas romance that's out. I like, Mm -hmm. I try and read as many as I can. So surely somebody's got a dog in one of them. (laughs) (laughs) They must, they must. I mean, it's probably out there and we just don't know about it. And honestly, this is like the year for gay holiday romance. In fact, the book that we're talking about today, which I'll officially introduce in a couple moments, is part of like an unofficial branded series known as the Holidays. And I was introduced to like this collection of books last year when I interviewed Alison Cochran, author of The Charm Offensive. And she at the time told me, well, I'm working on a woman loves woman holiday romance. And I told her, oh my God, that sounds amazing. I can't believe you're telling me this and I have to wait a year to read it. And she said, well, you know, it's going to be part of like this collection of completely unrelated stories that we're calling the holidays. And 
I think there's six different books, six different authors who have all kind of joined this this collective of gay Christmas, not even just Christmas, there's Hanukkah in there as well, Um, gay holiday romance. So if anybody is like craving queer holiday romance, you are definitely going to hear a few this season on Boobs Mess, and there's even more where that came from. Excellent. I mean, do yourself a favor and go check them out. Go find them. Yes, absolutely. And I will put links in uh, today's show notes so everybody knows how to go find them. And of course, there's going to be more queer holiday romance beyond that. But yes, I am super excited to celebrate the holidays this year. If for no other reason than I get to say holidays, like multiple right? times. Let, let me say it, Kelly, the holidays. I, I just have to. It's great. Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> right. That should be the new greeting for everybody. Happy holidays. I mean, I'm on board. I'm on board. So. Right. Right. <laughs> well, if people haven't already guessed it, um, would you mind telling everybody a little bit about your podcast? It's actually all the good dogs, Kelly. But all anyway, the good I'll dogs. Oh my that. gosh. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm so sorry. It's okay. So I like to call it a mixed bag of dog stuff. Some episodes are like people's stories with their dogs. My last interview actually was with Andrew Cotter of Olive and Mabel fame, if people remember them from uh, the lockdowns the COVID lockdowns in early 2020, he was making the video. So I was really excited to talk to him. But, you know, there's things like that. I talk to people about their dogs and we do uh, media reviews, including like movies. And like I mentioned, I've done a few book clubs with some romance novels. So, you know, like I said, it's a mixed bag. I love that. I love that. So you are a romance reader, clearly. Yes. Yes. It's uh, pretty much exclusively what I read, actually. (laughs) Do you, do you remember like how and when you got into reading romance? Oh, I was thinking about that and I think, you know, I started um, many, many years ago. I watched Queer as Folk and I was like, man, oh. the, the American version. And Oh, um, I didn't even realize there was another version. Shame <laughs> on me. Oh my God. So, <laughs> so the American version came off the British version. Um, of course it did. Yeah, of course. And, yeah, you know, I think I just started reading some fan fiction off of that, as you do. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that just kind of went from there. I was trying to think of the very first gay romance that I read, and I, for the life of me, I cannot. But one of the early series that I um, started reading was the Psychop series um, by Jordan Castillo-Price. So okay. that's probably one of the earliest ones that I remember reading. Yeah. Nice. So so it seems like queer romance especially is something that you you love to read. Yeah. And I'm at the moment I'm really on like a fantasy kind of kick. Like Ooh. dragons and fairies and things like that. So yeah. I love that. Make it Christmas. I want some Christmas in there too. Where's the Christmas fantasy? Oh my God. Here goes my mind starting to hypothesize all these future wow. books I want to read. <laughs> Wow, like some kind of gay holiday elf or something. Like, yeah, yeah, with a dog. There's got to be the dog, obviously, <laughs> obviously, right? <laughs> well, where can people find and follow you and listen to all the good dogs podcast? Yes, <laughs> um, just anywhere you listen to your podcast. There, and I have a website, um, gooddogspodcast.com, and you can also find the um, me on Facebook and Twitter if it still exists. <laughs> I Yikes. Know. Good Dogs Podcast. It's very simple. And if you type in all the good dogs, you'll find it. I'm about. Yes. I've already been thinking about, and I know everybody's talking about where people are going to go when Twitter inevitably plummets, um, uh, because it is. And I know people have mentioned Mastodon as an option, which I still don't really understand. And there's always like Discord servers, but I personally would love to see the rise of Tumblr again. <laughs> Oh my God. Yes. You know, back in the day when I was into Queer as Folk, I mean, I'm still into Queer as Folk, but when I was really heavily into it after watching it, that's where all the content was. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Tumblr was, oh, Tumblr, back, I feel so old, back in the day, Tumblr, Tumblr was the place. I mean, that was like, that was like where every teenager before they like had the gumption to look up porn on the internet was like finding... (laughs) inappropriate, not suitable for work, porn gifts on Tumblr. Right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) Such a good time to be alive. I would love to see that happen again. (laughs) 
I, I sometimes see celebrities and a few people use it and stuff, and I'm yeah. like, wow, that's still a thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Good. I love it. I'm here for it. I'm. We're going to bring back yeah. Tumblr. We're, there's probably people who have been on Tumblr all these years that are like, don't come over here. We never went away, yeah. but we'll, we'll <laughs> we see. We don't want you back. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, seeing as the holidays are upon us, I would love to know What's one of your favorite holiday traditions or memories? Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat and go for two, Kelly. I'm really sorry. Um, the last few years, um, m- my mum and I have really gotten into watching like Hallmark movies. Great. Um, so we we immerse ourselves in in whatever we can get, like on the streaming services and whatever, uh, with Christmas movies. Um, but I guess the main the main Christmas tradition that I love most of all. Um, mum started doing it many years ago. We have a, a thing called a memory tree and it's little photographs in ornaments of our past pets. Oh, I love yeah. that. It's just, it's just a nice way to have them around at Christmas. And yeah, yeah I just, that's my favorite Christmas tradition. I, I love that. And I think that that's something that, I mean, you could really adapt that in so many ways. It could be your pets. It could be, you know, family members who are no longer with yeah. us. It could it could even just be, uh, you know, pictures or memories of, of holidays past, you know. And, oh, God, that's so beautiful. I love that. Isn't it great? I, it's just my favorite thing. And it ties in with the dogs. So. Oh, yeah. No, of course. The dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Got to yeah. keep the but, dogs. But, but, but to be fair, on the tree, there's also like cats that we've had and birds and things like that as well. So, you know, it's not just the dogs. Oh, I love that. Well, that sounds yeah. like a great one and definitely one that people could adopt for their own their own homes if yeah. they, you know, wanted to. So good idea. Yeah, it's great. I love that. Well, OK, let's go ahead then and dive into our holiday romance for today. And today's reading selection is You're a Mean One, Matthew Prince by Timothy Janowski. And this is a contemporary queer romance published in October 2022, just recently. It's available on Amazon for $7.39 Kindle edition. It always cracks me up when it's just like such a specific cent <laughs> amount. And of course, I mean, I'm talking about uh, $7.39 in the, you know, American uh Amazon, because I'm sure you you purchased it in a very different way where you are. It was it was nine ninety one on Amazon <laughs> here. <laughs> That's even more weird and specific. I know. <laughs> there you go. All right, and like I mentioned, I know that this book isn't connected in any way, like by characters or or setting to the rest of the books in the uh, quote unquote holidays series. However, um, you know it is part of that family of books. So I'll definitely link in the Instagram page that they've set up for those books and people can check those out. Before I read the synopsis, I want to play a little game. And this is something Uh we are playing throughout our Boobsmas episodes this season. And I am calling it Tit or Tat, which really means nothing except I love incorporating boob lingo into just about anything I do, (laughs) hence the name of my podcast. So this is a this or that or would you rather based on things, people, places, items that you will find within your mean one, Matthew Prince. So some of these things might sound familiar based on your reading. Are you ready, Wow, Kate? I'm nervous. I'm <laughs> nervous. But hit me. Come on. Let's go. I know. Pressure's on. Oof, there's only one right Oof. answer, remember. <laughs> wow. No. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. We'll start with an easy one. White lights or rainbow lights? Ooh, rainbow. That's my family is full on rainbow lights as well. So I'm with you. An A-frame cabin for Christmas or a downtown penthouse for Christmas? Ooh, cabin. The cabin. Yeah, keep it cozy. Yeah, I'm a I'm a country girl, so I'm like, the being in the city for Christmas does not appeal to me. <laughs> Although a penthouse, <laughs> there's something about like if you were gonna be in a city and you had like the fanciest, swankiest type of living in the city, I, I could almost be convinced almost but I'm with you Mm -hmm. I do I do like the cozy feel yeah absolutely 
How about boozy eggnog or boozy hot chocolate? Oh, I have to say boozy hot chocolate because you know what? I have never had eggnog. It's not really a thing in Australia. It, really? it sort of is, but yeah. Okay. You know what's funny too is um, I, I know that people haven't heard this yet for the 12 Days of Boobsmas because this is an episode I recorded that'll come out later in the, the series of episodes. But uh, in one of the episodes, we talked about a drink that was actually mentioned in this book. And it's like the Puerto Rican version of eggnog. I think it's called Coquito. I I just found it so interesting because I had just recorded an episode where Laura, my guest, had told me about this. And I thought it sounded Mm. like the yummiest thing. It sounded better than regular eggnog. And then they were talking about it in this book. So (laughs) that was a fun coincidence. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, eggnog does not sound very appealing to me anyway, so, you know. It's in the name. Like, who wants to – it just sounds like you're drinking eggs. Yeah, no, not at all. Yuck. I mean, eggs are okay in their place, but no, not – (laughs) no. They're fine in, like, an omelette, but, like, I don't want to have, like, a cup of eggs. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. They're fine just in the chicken's nest. Just leave them there, thanks. (laughs) Okay, this one is a little less Christmassy, but it goes with the book, and that is a Gucci purse or a Burberry scarf. Oh, Burberry scarf. I love Burberry stuff. I mean, I can't afford Burberry stuff, but that's what I would go for. (laughs) Hey, fair enough. Bing Crosby or Michael Buble? Ooh. I know, they're both good. Go the Buble. Buble I've seen him in concert, actually. He's amazing. Oh, I'm jealous. I would love to see him. Yeah, he was great. Mm. It wasn't at Christmas time, but um, yeah, no, he was great. I miss, I feel like a few years ago for several years in a row, he would do this like annual special on TV that was like a holiday Mm -hmm. special of just him singing, you know, beautiful holiday songs. And I feel like they stopped doing that. And I really enjoyed watching that every year. Yeah, I feel like we might have got some of those here. I'm I'm not sure. I I, I have vague memories mm-hmm. of him singing Christmas songs. He's supposed to be coming out here in concert again oh. um, to Australia. And I was like, yeah, nah. <laughs> oh, you're like, been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay, how about something yummy? And that is chai sugar cookies or homemade cinnamon rolls. Ooh. Oh, cinnamon rolls. I don't I don't really think chai sugar cookie sounds very appealing, actually. I will say I was I, I have had like baked goods with chai in it, and so I do mm. love that, but I'm with you in that I think like chai sugar cookies isn't the the combo that I want. Like yeah. I want it in no. like maybe chai cinnamon rolls. I could get on board maybe. with that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm breaking all the rules now. Um, okay. The original book cover or the TV movie adaptation book cover? Ooh. Uh, I don't know, Kelly. I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> the original. Let's go the original. That's good. I was gonna, um, I was gonna say, to me, that is the only correct answer for this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay, to be fair, there have been a couple of times when I have purchased books that have been made into TV series or movies or whatever. And it's been the original cover and I've seen the adaptation, which I've really loved. And I've been Mm -hmm. like, damn, why didn't I get the movie adaptation cover? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, and and sometimes I think what's different now, too, and I'm sure you've noticed this as a reader, is sometimes authors will put out like multiple versions of their covers. They'll be the... The one that's a little bit more discreet or just has an object in the title and then other ones where it'll have a lot more graphics to it. And so it's, you know, but I, I, I do love the original versus, you know, like Jennifer Lawrence Hunger Games, like on my book Burn. cover. Burn. <laughs> Not that I don't enjoy Jennifer Lawrence. This is no shade on her. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was thinking um Good Omens. I got the one of the oh. it's not the original cover, but it's it's a black cover. Mm. I can't remember what else is on it. And then I saw the cover with David Tennant and uh, the other actor whose name yeah. I can't think of. Um and I was like, "Damn, that is so good. I really like that." Can I exchange this book? (laughs) Can I trade you this cover for the David Tennant cover, please? Exactly. (laughs) I think a lot of bookstores would be very understanding specifically for David Tennant. (laughs) 
<laughs> right? I feel like that it's a requirement. Come yeah. on. <laughs> I, in my bookstore, that would be fine. But yeah. <laughs> and then this is your final one. And this is based off of one of my favorite things in Your I Mean One, Matthew Prince. And that is the fact that Matthew comes up with these fake party ideas when he starts to experience anxiety and I just thought they were so funny and so I saved a few of them so you have to choose between make this all go away masquerade or the happy we didn't just die silent disco oh the second one the happy we didn't die silent disco disco. (laughs) Yeah, I have to say that was by far one of my favorite things in the book. I mean, obviously, it comes from a place of, uh, you know, a a moment where he's experiencing like great amounts of anxiety. So like, that's Mm. not the fun part. But I did love that one of his coping mechanisms was to like plan these hypothetical parties in his mind to like soothe himself. I thought that was so cute. I thought that was really a really creative way to go about it. I, I've not experienced anxiety like that myself, so I don't know what kind of coping mechanisms that people use, but certainly if that's what gets them through a panic attack or an anxiety attack, then I, I just thought it was fun. I mean, obviously, like you said, the anxiety part's not fun, but it was just it was just fun and creative. Yeah, well, and it's a great example of like taking something that a lot of people do experience, and I, I have to say I've been really pleased that we're starting to see a lot more rep in romance novels for Mm. all all different kinds of mental illnesses and anxiety disorders. And so not only like having that representation, but also having like a very specific individualized way of this character coping with it. That's so unique to this character. And I I really like that because I feel like usually it's, it's like, Oh, breathe in and out. And I understand that that's probably how most people do handle it, but I love seeing a different way that, you know, is so unique to this story and this character. Yeah, absolutely. And and then for him to manifest that into a business, which he clearly, yes. you know, has a, a talent for and wanted to do. Um, you know, I, I really liked that. I like that aspect of his personality. Yeah. Well, that seems like the perfect way to transition then into talking about the book. And so I will go ahead and give everybody the brief synopsis for You're a Mean One, Matthew Prince, and stay tuned because then we will dive into our chat. So here we mm-hmm. go. Bring a little joy to the world? Not today, Santa. <laughs> Matthew <laughs> Prince is young, rich, and thoroughly spoiled. So what if his parents barely remember he exists and the press is totally obsessed with him? He's on top of the world. But one major PR misstep later and Matthew is cut off and shipped away to spend the holidays in his grandparents' charming small town hellscape. Population, who cares? It's bad enough he's stuck in some festive winter wonderland. It's even worse that he has to share space with Hector Martinez, an obnoxiously attractive local who's unimpressed with anything and everything Matthew does. Just when it looks like the holiday season is bringing nothing but heated squabbles, the charity gala loses its coordinator and Matthew steps in as a saintly act to get home early on good behavior with Hector as his maddening plus one. But even a Grinch can't resist the unexpected joy of found family, and in the end, the forced proximity and infectious holiday cheer might be enough to make a lonely prince's heart grow three sizes this year. Oh, that rhymes. I didn't even realize it until I read it aloud. (laughs) I have to say... um. Shout out to whoever wrote this synopsis and people who listen to this podcast know I shit on synopses a lot on this show because I just (laughs) feel like they're either way too long or they Mm. give away the entire story or it's the opposite where it's almost like it's just what happens in chapter one. And this is a really well written synopsis and it also has so much like personality to it that I think yeah matches the book pretty well so um kudos to whoever you are that wrote it 
<laughs> it makes it sound very, very appealing, doesn't it? Like sometimes they're just like, oh, well, you know, there's two dudes and, you know, yeah. they get it on. <laughs> wow. Okay, great. Well, I'm there for that. But like, is there a plot? <laughs> right. Like, I mean, I will still read it. However. Exactly. You know, but no, this this is one of those books that I knew about months ago. I saw the cover, loved it. Saw the title, laughed out loud, loved it. Um, read the synopsis, although definitely didn't realize it had a nice little rhyme at the end and was immediately into it. And so I knew that this was one that I wanted to read for Boobs Miss and just for the holiday season in general. And yeah. personally, I really enjoyed it. I think this is kind of like exactly what I was needing right now. So I really appreciated it. But I want to turn it over to you and ask how you if you enjoyed the book. Oh, well, Kelly. Wow. Um, <laughs> first of all, this is not my usual kind of fair. Like I don't, I don't normally read contemporary. I, I, I do sometimes. Um, I definitely don't normally read new adult because sometimes mm. I feel like I'm almost old enough to be these kids' mother. <laughs> and to be fair, I didn't even realize how young they were when I did pick yeah. the book because that was yeah. something that did not register with me I was you know what it reminded me of and I still did get this in the book is it reminded me of Schitt's Creek it gave me all the vibes of like this is like the David the David character from Schitt's Creek where it's like he's been cast out to the small town and obviously he's not going with his entire family it's just him but that's who like Matthew reminded me of a lot and I did not realize until I read the first chapter that he's supposed to be like 21 22 like, yeah 21 I was like oh my god he's a child he's a little baby yeah. like so I'm with you on that one that was that was unexpected for me and I think too the way the characters were written both of them because Hector's also 21 I think or 22 I they felt so much older and I I feel like perhaps the uh, the author is maybe older and written from perhaps that perspective I don't know I mean I'm just guessing mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I was kind of like, okay, the 21, okay, I can deal with this. But then I was also a little worried when it said it was for fans of red, white, and royal blue. And I'm like, oh no, oh no, I'm not a fan of that book. (laughs) Oh really? Well, that's a whole separate conversation we could have another time. (laughs) I I know, I know. Um, But I didn't, I didn't dislike this book. I I think I kind of went, went into it expecting that I was going to dislike it. And I found, I did find it a little slow at times, but you know, it was cheesy Christmas fun and I can definitely see why it's appealing, you know, to a lot of people and why it's just a nice, easy read um, for some. So I'm kind of on the fence, to be honest. Like I did, I did enjoy it, but you know, I had a few issues and I guess the pace was a little off for me too. Well, and I'm sure it's different too when it's like you're coming into it with these, I don't want to say expectations set, but just like, oh my God, it's contemporary I don't usually read that it's new adult I don't usually read or like that yeah you know I mean you're kind of heading into it with already I feel like a kind of mindset that you're preparing yourself for the worst so yeah exactly yeah Yeah. so I mean if it turned around for you I think that's you know mission accomplished (laughs) yeah exactly so no yeah I feel like I feel like probably I did come into it with those kind of oh no expectations and that happens but you know yeah, I was pleasantly surprised. Like I had a few chuckle moments and, you know, overall, I think for me, I mostly enjoyed the character of Matthew. Mm-hmm. Um, although sometimes I felt like he was written a little off. Like sometimes he was like super snobby and like really turned his nose up at everything in, in what was it? Windy, Wind River? Yeah. Wind River? Windy some, River? Something yeah. like that. Upstate and, New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Upstate New York. <laughs> Who goes there? There's only Manhattan new book isn't there like (laughs) but yeah so sometimes I was like oh wow and then other times he was like you know super sensitive and not Mm -hmm. a product of his upbringing and I was like you know and like we talked about before the event planning when he gets his anxiety attacks and yeah and his flair for fashion and things like that I I really yeah I like characters like that so I think that's probably what kept me going throughout the book yeah I this like I said this was so reminiscent of Schitt's Creek to me and I don't know if that's Mm. I I don't know if that was purposeful like I don't know if that was on Timothy Janowski's mind like when he was writing it but it reminded me of like when I watched Schitt's Creek for the first time how it took me a while to get invested because and I tell this to everybody who hasn't watched the show yet that 
the first. I haven't watched it. <laughs> okay, well here you go. Here you go. This is your okay. this is your word of advice when it comes to it. The first season and a half is somewhat difficult to watch because when the show starts they're not good people. Like they're, no, I, I don't want to say they're bad guys, but they're, they're spoiled. They are entitled. It's, it's very much what you get in the first third of this book from Matthew Prince in that he mm. just, you know, he, I mean, like you said, he's got his, his style is very specific. He wears designer clothing. He um, expects everybody to do everything for him. He's never had to, Oh, what was the one he oh, the one that had me howling was when they're trying to make cookies and he doesn't know what it means to beat an egg <laughs> or beat the dough. So he just starts punching the shit out of the dough in the bowl. And I, I but I mean, and it reminded me of an actually a specific scene in Shit's Creek that is very much like this where they're trying to cook. And when you get past that and you get to the part where they start to open up you fall in love with them. You fall in love with the characters and the family and you root for them. And those little moments will still sneak in where you're like, oh, yeah, this is not like a thought that most people have. Like you're you're still in fantasy land with, with this thought. But yeah. <laughs> then the people that love them, that they've connected with, bring them back down to earth and they're there for them. And that is... It was just so reminiscent of that, that I think that's kind of, um, I was fine with that. I, cause I knew, yeah. I knew I was like, he can't be a pompous asshole start to finish. Like there's no way we've read enough romance to know that like, he's got to have some kind of character growth and. Yeah, exactly. But you know, I felt like even at the beginning, he he wasn't totally snobbish and and pompous and entitled yeah. there were like little glimpses of him that yeah. you know he felt exploited by his mother and and things like that and he used a lot of it as a lot of that pomp and and snobbishness as like a shield to you know keep people right. away and and things like that so i knew that there was something more to him than just gucci bags yeah you know <laughs> he has a lot he has a lot he of does. style yeah so i will say i do recommend that whenever it happens someday you do decide to sit down and watch shit's creek and i just stick with it like stick through mm. the moments that you're like oh i don't know if I'm going to like this, because I promise it'll be worth it. Well, I definitely like uh, the cast because I know, you know, the the mum and the dad. Yeah. I don't know the, the actors, but yeah, you know, so <laughs> I, I will check it out mm -hmm. when I, you know. Can. Eventually, whenever you want to. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so that's that was like a fun thing for me to connect with. Um, but yeah, I, I think this book does so much good stuff for representation, too, because we have so many queer characters in this story. Mm. Um, we have, you know, Hector, who's also Puerto Rican and Spanish. And so he, you know, I mean, there's not, I won't say there's a lot of like racial diversity in this town, but it is also upstate New York. <laughs> so I don't, <laughs> I don't know if that's what I was expecting, but I kind of love too that like when Matthew's there and he meets these characters who are, there's also a trans woman. I mean, like, we have this great cast of queer characters who basically tell him, yeah, this is kind of like a unicorn town. Like, everybody is accepting, again, something you will find on Chits Creek. And I love, this is what I love about this, and we're starting to see this in more books and movies and shows as well, is we in the real world are frightened we're scared for like characters like this in towns mm -hmm. like this because we have yeah. ideas of how they will be treated and how people will respond I like that people are creating worlds where that's not the reality that the reality is that the reality is what it should be that it's yeah this is just a town and everybody who dates whoever nobody cares everybody's fine we all get along. We, you know, paint rainbows in our crosswalks and it's beautiful. Like, I, I love that. I, yeah. I don't like when people will read a book and be like, oh, well, that's not realistic. Like, racism should still exist or like there should still be homophobia. 
really? It's a book. Should like, it? I don't, yeah. <laughs> it's just such a weird thing for people to like advocate for. So I love to read a story like this where it's this beautiful bubble and everyone is very accepting and loving, especially for a holiday book. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes my my realistic brain cannot I, suspend the disbelief. Me I, too. I struggle. I'm yeah. with you. I, I am with you. And I will do it for a lot of other things. Like, believe me, I when it comes to like characters getting UTIs, I focus on that a lot more in my mind <laughs> than I do with, oh, everybody gets along. Let's just let it be. Let's let them be happy. Like, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, UTIs, I, mean, I, I will never forget. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> you know, as a person that lives in a small town, um, you know, it's a very, it's a very white community. It's a very, I want to say, it's a very straight community, or it was. And like, you start to see lots of different types of, and I don't want to say different as in like the, the you know, but all sorts of people like have moved in, and I, and it's so great because I feel yeah. like you know my area has been very just white for so long Mm -hmm. and we just we need the diversity and I I just love that when I start to see it when people move in so I definitely like that aspect you know in books when there's like a small town where there is a lot of diversity yeah and yeah so that was that was definitely a great aspect of this book but then I'm like is that super realistic no just let it be let it be let them be happy like I think for me it's always like I I let it go when it's sort of like the hopeful version of it, like the idealized yeah. version. Yeah. I don't let it go when it's something that's more of like a negative mm. impact where it's like leaving it out is like the negative impact. Um, but yeah. yeah, that's me. I I mean, I know every reader reads differently. So, um, you know, to each their own. I also, I love that even in a holiday book, we're not shying away from some of the darker Moments Like, I mean, it's interesting because I know we just talked about how they live in this like beautiful little bubble where everybody is so accepting and nobody is a bigot. And that's great. But then you also have, you know, Matthew has this anxiety disorder that is Mm. very difficult for him at times. And he has he's had to deal with sort of like the celebrity child syndrome of like growing up in the spotlight and how that's affected him and his family and his relationships. He talks about a breakup he had where he was part of like a thruple with a married couple. Um, His like friend. Also like he's 21. Seriously. How much he's he's got a lot of experience. Have you not seen Gossip Girl? Like, come on. These, I mean, like (laughs) it's a leaf. I thought that was TV, but okay. I just, I, I just think of all the like celebrities whose like memoirs I've read and like stories I've seen where they'll be like, oh yeah, like we would go clubbing and like go to this. And I'm like, you were 13. Like how were, how was this happening? Like, but it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair, fair enough. (laughs) But yeah, no, I mean, so he has to deal with like so much other, so much other baggage, like when it comes to, Mm. and and even, it even ends with, you know, his parents are going to get divorced. And so I oh like, Oh my God, what a Christmas climax that was. I what know. jerks are his parents? They were awful. And then to not only put him through all of this, but to also be like on Christmas, yeah, we're getting divorced. And also I lied to you about Hector, like saying that, you know, he, he'd given away like the thing we were trying to cover up. I'm just like, excuse me like that's a lot (laughs) I I you know the the sort of the back end of this book the last few chapters really sort of hit a pace and I was like well it's really taking off now and then I was like oh my god what who who is this family what is going on here it got real dark and and I do you know what I do like though is that the way that he concludes sort of like the the issues with his family um are not it's not like a you know, picture perfect bow on top. Like they're getting divorced. That's fine. But he basically, Mm. he goes to therapy. He goes back to see them and is talking to them and is like, these are the things that I need from you. But also like, um, I'm not forgiving you right now. Like this, this is clearly something that you're going to have to work on and we're going to have to work on together if you want me to be in your lives. Because you can't say sorry and make this all go away. And I really appreciated that. There was so much in this that just felt so modern and very reminiscent of like 
the Gen Zers today and just how they kind of are going after what they want and saying what they want and what they need and going to therapy and doing all these things to take care of their their problems. And I I appreciate yeah. that so much about that generation. Yeah, oh, absolutely. They're really showing us all up, aren't they? I know, right? <laughs> It's it's true. It's and honestly, I'm okay with it. I am okay with it. Yeah. I I think the Same. the best thing I saw somebody point out was like, you know, I'm a millennial, and so it's like millennials can identify the issues, but Gen Zers are the ones who are taking the action to prevent the issues from happening, and mm. we just complain. We're just like, oh, didn't this thing suck when we were growing up? Yeah. Right. Pass me the wine. <laughs> like... I mean, I'm I'm with you. I'm I'm an elder millennial, yeah. <laughs> um, which it's the term I hate, but I just like to clarify. <laughs> look, I'm not. I'm old, but I'm not that old, all right? Like <laughs> I'm in the middle, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, whatever. It's just yeah, just give me back the 80s and the 90s, okay? Like <laughs> I know, I know, but. Gosh, they're giving us something to look forward to, that's for sure. Yeah, we'll be too old to appreciate it, though. Don't you <laughs> dare say that, Kate. <laughs> okay. I have to say, one thing that really, really annoyed me with this book Tell was me. Hector's constant use of dude. Okay, it's so dude. funny because I saw a bunch of reviews that said the same thing, and mm. I, I was in the middle on it. Like, I... I found it cute sometimes, mm. and then other times it just got to the point where it felt like we were beating the horse with the dead, beating the horse with the dead stick, beating the dead horse <laughs> with the stick. <laughs> but yeah, no, I just, I thought it was cute a few times, and I liked that, you know, Matthew was like, this is weird that you're calling me dude. Like, mm. I don't know. It didn't need to be every sentence. I know. I mean, sometimes I might say, I might say dude once in a while, like if it's an expression and I could get that if they're like, you know, as an exclamation point on a sentence or something like that. Right. But just like, even when he was like being affectionate and stuff, I'm like, whoa, really? Yeah. It's, it's weird. Well, Please and stop. this could be me reading too much into it, but I feel like I, I've read other male, male romances before where one or both of the men has been, I'll say either like questioning their sexuality or it's been kind of like a discovering their sexuality later in life. And I feel like I've seen them use dude and bro in a lot of those circumstances to make them feel more masculine or like what we might think of as like yeah. traditionally masculine. And so mm. I don't know. I And I, I kind of tied that into the fact that of the two of them, Matthew is gay and Hector is bi. And so I wondered if it was kind of something, I don't know, like leaning into stereotypes a little bit of like meant to make him feel more like the masculine one of the two of them. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I But I feel like even if you're a masculine man's man, mm -hmm. um, it's still excessive. Like really yeah. excessive. <laughs> it's just a lot of dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, I do not buy somebody from Texas saying dude that much. And I granted, I haven't spent a lot of time in Texas, but I'm from California and I don't think anybody I know would say dude that much. Like, <laughs> and I feel like we're the dude capital of America. Yeah. I feel like sort of California and, and Australia in like beach Australia in yeah. some respects is kind of like the surfy dude thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't even think we say, I think we say mate. Some people say mate excessively yeah. in Australia. And it's like, really? <laughs> no, stop it. Please. Mate is the is the dude of Australia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, especially as we head into the portion of the show where we usually share a segzerpt or two, uh, what were your thoughts on the spice level of this book? Well, I mean, there wasn't really much, was there? <laughs> you know what, though? I have to say there was actually more than I thought there was going to be. <laughs> Same for like for like a new adult novel. I was like, oh, should kids be reading this? <laughs> <laughs> Not kids. Yeah, I know they're adults, but you know, I'm that old. They're, they're kids, okay? Basically, yeah. No, well, and especially too, because I've found that just there are a lot of 
I feel like the default when it comes to holiday romance is keep it sweet, keep it light, like don't make it too spicy. And I I wasn't really sure what to expect as far as the spice yes, level I... went in this one. So I, I was like pleasantly surprised by how much was there, but also... I mean, I like I like to read more, so. Yeah, same, same. <laughs> but I, I feel like it was, you know, it was written, in, I don't want to say tasteful because that's not the right word, but it was like referred to without being explicit. Yeah, it was it was like appropriate to the story too, I felt like. Like yes. I, it's not that I would have expected them to just go, you know, have something super hot and spicy too. And I actually, yeah. I actually still found it pretty, um, pretty saucy like at times like I have I don't know if you have a sex excerpt selected but I want to share mine with you and it's the first time that they hook up uh not they make out watching a movie which is very cute but it's not that one it's when they actually hook up and um mm. what I liked about this scene is Hector's hands are cold and so oh my god <laughs> like just just so people know leading up to the section I'm about to read he they start making out and Matthew tells him, oh, your hands are really cold. And so in response, Hector says, warm them, he instructs, presenting his fingers to me using the bratty tone from the day we met. Except this time it's fucking sexy. So fucking sexy that it shakes up my insides like a snow globe. <laughs> I... <laughs> Okay, I I have to comment. I do have more, but I have to comment on that because I feel like this is another thing I notice in a lot of holiday romance is they'll start to get really hot and they'll start to get really sexy. And then it's like they need to remind us that it's also Christmas. So it'll be like I (laughs) an analogy. (laughs) Yeah, like I licked her until she was wet enough to melt icicles. Like I it's just it's always (laughs) It's always something that I'm just like, oh, yeah, we just, we had to get that in there. We know it's Christmas. Mm. We know it's Christmas. Thank you. I just needed that reminder. Thank you. (laughs) Anyway, okay, we shook up his insides like a snow globe. Without hesitation, I take his forefinger in my mouth. My tongue wanders over the ridges of bone, tasting his calluses. Before I do the same to the next finger and the next and the next Then he's presenting me with his other hand, and before I know it, I'm blowing hot breath up their sides, so entranced by this strangely erotic act. So in the moment that it scares me, he goes to touch my face again, but I flinch. Still cold. The straining denim below my waist gives me an idea. Try this. I undo my belt and slip his hand into the deep warmth there. I cringe at first, sudden shock, but settle into the firm press of his palm. Much better, he whispers. And I was like, ooh, um, I didn't realize I was going to get as turned on reading about this guy licking the other man's fingers as much as I did. Um, But also... Don't you dare shove your like cold ass hand into my pants. Like that's not cool. I I was like, okay, I I don't the finger licking, I'm like, nah, whatever. I think I'm it's going with it. I think it's because it was unexpected for me. Like, and that's mm. usually what gets me is I'll be like, oh, I did not see this coming. <laughs> like, I did not see us taking it in this direction. I'm excited. <laughs> I I wasn't. I don't know why. I was just, especially with like the cold hands, and I was like, no, yeah, that that's not gonna warm them. That's just gonna make you cold. <laughs> yeah, no, sticking them down like in my cooch. I'm just like, nah. No, I, I I'm gonna need no, you to warm you. those up before you put them down there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, maybe some people are into that. I personally am not. Yeah. So. <laughs> See, there you go. To each their own. But um, did you did you have a different scene that you wanted to read from? I didn't really have anything that stuck out. Is that okay? That's totally fine. And honestly, I gave people a little taste. Ha ha ha. With my scene. And if they want to find more, they're just going to have to read the book themselves. So exactly. (laughs) Well, I think it's about time that we give this book a few grades because I am 
a teacher, the daughter of teachers. So any excuse to grade something and I'm there. And this time around, we are grading for heart, humor, heat. And because it is the season, I've added an extra rating for holiday. Oh, mm hmm. Yeah. Extra fun. Extra letter. Let's start <laughs> with um, heart. What do you think out of 10? 10 being the very best that could it could be for you. What what comes under heart? Is that like romance factor or I think it could just include, how much I love it? I think it could include a few things. For me, I always sort of factor in the I call it like the feels. Like the feels mm-hmm. between the characters and that could be like romance but also familial. It could be friendship, you know, anything where there's a heart element involved the feeling factor well okay for the feeling factor I might I might give it like a seven I think because there was a lot of a lot of feels aside from the romance you know there was some great friendships formed and there was some great um family reconnections with uh, Matthew's grandparents and and things like that his parents are still shit so they get nothing (laughs) but (laughs) (laughs) but yeah so I'm gonna go with like a seven with that one yeah, that's I gave it a seven as well because I'm I'm right there with you. I think there's a lot of great friendships formed. I did enjoy the love story between Matthew and Hector because it kind of felt like a friend's I know they're sort of mm. enemies at first, but it, it felt more like a friends to lovers situation for me that they it, kind of established yeah. this friendship as well. Um yeah. so I did I did like that. And I liked his grandparents too. <laughs> Yeah, they were great. <laughs> Although I have to say, like, initially Grandma asks him to plan the, the gala, the Christmas gala. And mm-hmm. then when he finally agrees to it, she's like, oh, I don't really think you can do it. I I'm think, like, I think Grandma. It was all, I think it was all a game for Grandma. I feel like Grandma was, yeah. like, setting them up from the beginning. I feel like Grandma was like, I'm going to make him, like, she was like the fairy godmother character where she's like, I know everything about everybody, and I'm going to make it yeah. all work out for you. I love a good meddling <laughs> granny. <laughs> oh, my God. So do I. I love it. <laughs> okay. How about humor? Because I will say there are some humorous moments in this book. I wouldn't necessarily think of it as a rom-com. There is some humor. I'd say probably just like middle of the road, like maybe a five because because it's not, I don't think it's meant to have humor in it or too much, but there were a few chuckle moments for me. So, you know, it was fine. It was fine in that aspect. Yeah, I'm with you. I was maybe even going to give it like a four, four and a half. And yeah, that's, that's not fair. to say I didn't you know, enjoy it and that there weren't moments like you said that did, you know, make me a little laugh out loud a little bit. Um, But there's just so much other darker stuff that Matthew's going through that kind of outweighs, I think, a lot of the the humor. Mm. So, yeah, but that's okay. How about heat? I'm curious what this ends up on like your heat scale. Wow. For me personally, Mm, I think it like I think like a four. Really. Okay, it's, it's it's pretty tame. I'm a little torn on this one because the scale that I've basically put together for boobies and newbies is that if there's at least an open door sex scene, it's a five. Like we start from a five and then we work our way up from there. And what's interesting about the sex scenes in this book, and there are a couple, there are a couple of them. There's two, I think. They're not necessarily the most explicit though. So like they are open door. However, the descriptions then there are not as open door. Like it's like, it's like the door is open, but like you haven't put on your glasses yet. So like, Mm. it's not, it's still a little blurry. Yeah, exactly. It's written. (laughs) And again, I don't want to use the word tasteful because I think that's wrong to use, Mm -hmm. like, because I don't think any, like, erotic is not distasteful, but no, like, um, but but that's sort of the best word that I can come up with. Like it, it alludes to things without being very explicit. Yeah. So I'm probably going to stick around a five, between a five and a six and, um, but, you know, I, I will say I was pleasantly surprised by, you know what? I'm going to give it the six um, because oh, I was pleasantly surprised. Just give it. <laughs> there was finger licking good times had. And so. That was not my thing. I was like, oh. <laughs> She's like you oh. know what? All I could think of was like, they've been shifting dirty boxes. 
<laughs> and then you put that and I'm just, oh no. <laughs> there and then you get the UTI. There it is. There we've come full circle back to the UTI. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I'm just like, no, somebody wash their hands, please. Wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Did you learn nothing during the pandemic? <laughs> Okay, well, and to round it out, let's give it a holidays rating. So as far as like the holiday festivities, you know, feelings, eats, treats, all that jazz, uh, where are we landing on one to ten? I feel like this is this is like an eight or a nine because there was a lot of, you know, it reminded me a lot of a Hallmark movie in the sense yeah. that like there was the cookie baking and there was, you know, the tree trimming and it was everything. So I, I, I'm i thinking like an eight and a half, maybe or a nine. Yeah, I'm going to give it a solid nine because for okay. me, this is like, I think I'm taking away a point because his parents are getting divorced and they tell him no, on that's Christmas. that's what I was thinking too. <laughs> and it's, you know, what's funny is I've seen this in so many romance novels where there will be like all the festivities leading up to Christmas and then Christmas itself will suck. And I'm just like, wait a second. We, wh- what? We've had this month long holiday-ish adventure only to get to like the big kahuna of the holidays and there's nothing. So <laughs> yeah. And I mean, granted, it's not nothing. Like they do go to see the Rockettes and have their fancy dinner or whatever, mm. but it's not it's not the merry the merriment that I needed. But isn't then that like real life too? Like you build up Christmas. Oh, for sure. One hundred percent. And then the day is like, oh god, I've got to spend time with these people. Oh wait, it's my family. <laughs> no, I and honestly, completely understand. I spend most of Christmas driving between mm. different Christmas activities, and I just am like, oh my god, someday, someday, I'm gonna make them come to me, and if they don't want to come to me then I'm not seeing them because I am just so sick of driving to like three different Christmases on the day of Christmas. So just do it. Just say, look, I'm hosting Christmas at my place. You're all welcome. Mm -hmm. You don't come. Well, I'll see you in the new year. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if people want to donate to the Patreon so I can buy a house and make that happen, (laughs) (laughs) let's do it. (laughs) Yep. Well, this has been such a treat, and I'm glad that we read this one together. I'm glad that we've hopefully introduced our listeners to a lot more holiday reading for the rest of December because we yeah. are just getting started. This is only the second day of Boopsmith, so there's so much more to come. I'm excited. I, I'm excited for lots of holidays. <laughs> time holidays times that doesn't make any sense but you know where I'm going with that <laughs> happy holidays yeah it's true I, I just want to say yeah. it to everyone everywhere I go so um we are going to pass along the happy holidays to everybody but absolutely in the meantime on the second day of boobs miss my lover gave to me two, two nipple, nipple clamps. clamps take it away Cooper on the second day of boobs, Miss My Lover gave to me two nipple clamps and a heart. 